everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado. Today on the show, we have Ralph Blumenthal. Michelle and I got the opportunity to interview him, uh, what, a couple weeks ago, and we wanted to actually rush the release of this because it's um, really interesting and really timely. So Ralph probably is most famous for breaking a lot of the um, reports of Navy pilots discussing UFO phenomenon or you know, uh, what unidentified aerial phenomenon is what they like to call it now, UAP and, um, into the New York times, really interesting character. Uh, the real reason we have Ralph on the show is to talk about his, uh, recent biography of Dr. John Mack. If you don't know who Dr. John Mack is, he is a amazing Harvard psychiatrist, uh, now deceased. Unfortunately, he, found an interesting bridge in between psychiatry and uh, I guess UFO experiencers is what they like to be called. And really just a fascinating, fascinating deal. And, and Dr. Stan Groff is in the mix, Holotropic Breathworks in the story as well. So there's a, a lot going on here. Uh, so Ralph is a uh, staff writer at the Times, New York Times. Uh, he's got a ton of awards to his name. Guggenheim Fellowship, 2001. Yeah, a distinguished lecturer at Baruch College of the City, University of New York. Yeah, won a number of awards at, at New York Times from uh, while, he, while he was there. I, I think he wrapped up his career there in 2009 based on his website's bio. He wrote a number of books on organized crime and, and cultural history. He led the Times Metro team that won the Pulitzer Prize for breaking news coverage in the uh, of the 93 truck bombing of the World Trade Center. Yeah, so it really... Um, extraordinary person, Ralph Blumenthal, the author of this biography, and also John Mack. John Mack won a Pulitzer for, for biography. He's also a Harvard psychiatrist. And um, yeah, just a, a fascinating thing here. So so the bridge with the UFOs and the psychedelics is Stan Groff largely, and, and that John Mack was interested in psychedelics as well. So this is a, a really amazingly famous psychiatrist that put his whole career on the line to dig into this uh, interesting topic. And um, yeah, I've only read maybe a couple chapters of the book so far. I really want to finish it. Um, I, I'm, I'm told a copy is coming in the mail soon. So I can't wait to dig in. I've got a, got a digital, but you know, physical books are a little bit nicer for me. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it for now. Um, publisher, High Road Books. You can check out Ralph's website, ralphblumenthal.com. And uh, yeah, I hope you like this episode. It's really fun. Really grateful for Michelle for thinking of this one. And, um, <laughs> you know, a little bit of uh, personal stuff. Um, she's really interested in this UFO topic. I, I spent years and years on it. it uh, the data in psychedelics was a little bit more um, manageable. And um, <laughs> I decided to stick with psychedelics. Uh, both wildly interesting, though. And um yeah, a lot of alien talk in the psychedelic landscape. So perhaps they're here. I don't know. Uh, and I don't know if any of you have watched any videos. I've got the X-Files poster behind me. I want to believe with like a really <laughs> classic UFO shot behind it. So you'll see that on YouTube once in a while, but it's been on my wall for a while now. Anyway, I think that's enough. The book is called The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and The Passion of John Mack. It came out March 15, 2021 available all over the place. So check it out and maybe uh, talk your library into buying a copy because it's uh, just really great to spread this data. And uh, okay, so ads. Um, <laughs> I'll make it really short. May 20, we start up our eight-week Navigating Psychedelics for Clinicians and Therapists program. It's an amazing course, at least 47 hours of material, including eight different uh, live supported classes with Kyle and I. Um, we meet once a week for an hour and a half roughly and dig into the material we worked through in between classes. So great stuff. I, I love it a lot. It's one of my favorite things I do here. And uh, we got all sorts of testimonials up on the site if you want to check that out. I've taught and um, people from over 20 countries and counting. So it's coming. <laughs> all right. You can learn more about that class at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And uh, I think that's it. Uh, we'll see you on the other side. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado. Today on the show, we have Ralph Blumenthal, author of a new amazing book on 
Dr. John Mack, really important psychiatrist. How are you doing today, Ralph? Hey, great. Great to be on with you. Yeah, really excited. Um, I've been anticipating this one for a few months now. So just really excited to have you. Uh, what's, what's the full title of your book, Ralph? Uh, it's uh, The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and the Passion of John Mack. Yeah, I love that turn of phrase right there, passion of John Mack. Well, I try to touch all the you know the yeah. bases because uh, I talk about aliens. Obviously, that was his. We'll talk a little bit about who he is and who, who he was and why he was interested. But uh, alien abduction was his big research project. Hard science because uh, I do go into the the science of it. I don't take every you know anything for, for granted. No, nothing on faith and the passion because uh, he was very passionate and it does evoke actually right around this Easter season. <laughs> so <laughs> the image of, uh, uh, you know, what he was subjected to, I'm not comparing him to, a, you know, <laughs> religious figure, but, uh, but there was something of his martyrdom in the story. Yeah. Cool. So I guess let's uh, start a little bit with um, who, who was Dr. John Mack? Okay. Uh, John Mack was a psychiatrist at Harvard University, a professor of psychiatry as well, who uh, became very interested in the uh, uh, mystery of alien abduction. Uh, so this was quite uh, a departure for an esteemed you know, professor of psychiatry, mm -hmm. Harvard Medical School icon. So right then and there, uh, he, he becomes an interesting figure. He, um, he pursued his research in, uh, publicly. Uh, he was on a lot of shows. He was on Oprah. He wrote two best-selling books, which did not sit particularly well with Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, so there was some unpleasantness there. They put him under an inquiry, but he emerged basically unscathed. And then he went on to investigate uh, a lot of other uh, you know, associated fields of uh, paranormal and uh, uh, anomalous activity, and uh, uh, he ended up uh, dying in a in a car accident in London, at, almost at the age of seventy five. He was run down by a drunk driver. Mm. So that's his trajectory. But he really became a uh, an icon to people who study, uh, you know, UFOs and the whole mystery of alien abduction because of he came from such a you know a respected background. And Mac mm. was exceptional because he really listened to these folks who had experiences, right? Where other psychiatrists maybe weren't as open or willing to explore these issues. He did. I mean, he was really the first one to uh, give it serious attention. And uh, a lot of the people who came to him with these stories uh, had, been, had been to see other psychiatrists who tried to give them, you know, medication. Uh, they thought they were mentally ill. They you know, treated them as patients. And John Mack didn't really treat them as patients. He treated them as people to be studied, research uh, people, not people with any particular, you know, ailment although they were traumatized by their experiences. So, you know, John Mack was one of the people, uh, probably the first person of such a high uh, intellectual level and professional level to, to take these accounts seriously. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. Thank you for, for laying that out for the listeners. Before we dig deeper into John Mack's work, I'd love to learn how, a little bit more about you, Ralph, like um, your background and how you got interested in John Mack. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm probably the least likely person <laughs> to uh, get into this field because my whole career, I spent 45 years at the New York Times, uh, much of it in investigative reporting. First of all, I was a foreign correspondent uh, covering the war in Vietnam. I was a foreign correspondent in West Germany during the Cold War. And, and um, I uh, investigated... Uh, corrupt politicians, uh, the mafia, uh, uh, Nazi war criminals. Wow. Um, so my, my background was really in, you know, very, very down to earth, you might say. <laughs> so, uh, although I was a science fiction fan, by the way, uh. and, uh, growing up as, as we all were in, you know, post-war era, uh, that was the big field. And, mm. uh, you know, I was really reading Isaac Asimov and Robert Heinlein and uh, all the other great masters, Ray Bradbury. So anyway, but that, that passed and I, you know, ended up in journalism. <laughs> so, uh, 
but what what got me uh, hooked, you might say, like like John Mack got hooked, uh, was picking up one of his books, uh, the second book, as it turned out, Passport to the Cosmos, and um, and realizing here was a Harvard psychiatrist uh, writing about alien abduction, and that really got my attention as a as a newspaper man. Uh, that this was an interesting idea for a feature story. I had no idea how how famous he already was. Uh, this was in 2004 when I picked up his book. And um, I thought sort of naively, I, I should give him a call and maybe, you know, interview him. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize how famous he already was, which he was. He'd been on Oprah, as I said. He'd written two books. He'd been in the New York Times. But I missed it all. So um, I was going to pursue a story on him when he was, I picked up the paper one day and saw he was killed. Wow. And run over in London. So um, uh, I called his family. I made contact with them. They were really in deep grief. Um, but we ended up staying in contact. And eventually they gave me access to all his papers and archives and journals and analysis tapes and um, uh, his entire archive. And um, so that's how I got into it. Um, I, I was fascinated uh, to, to hear about this as he was when he first heard about it. So interesting, almost a little bit synchronistic, I might say. Well, I, come, I came across a lot of synchronicities uh, in the course of this. As I say in my book, um, uh, it turns out that John Mack's father was a professor at City College of New York when I was a student there. Wow. And I knew I, I, I didn't have any, was, I didn't take him for any courses in the English department, but I was an English major. He was an English professor. I knew about him. Uh, I didn't know he had a son. I certainly didn't know his son was going to study alien abduction in the future because nobody knew that. But uh, there was that was one of many synchronicities that came up in the course of uh of my research. Ooh, fun. Yeah, maybe we'll come back to that. I do love me a good synchronicity. Uh, one thought I had while you were talking about your process and learning about Mac was, you know, this means that it took you a pretty long time to write this book, right? Like how many years were you working on your bio? Uh, it took me 16 years. Wow. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, from beginning to end. I, I heard about it in 2004. Uh, when I picked up his uh, his book, Passport to the Cosmos, I was a correspondent in Texas at the time, uh, a correspondent for the New York Times, and I started working on it pretty much, uh, you know, then and uh, on and off, you know, a little time off here and there. But uh, before I finished, 16 years had passed, so um, uh, it, it took a big chunk of my life. Really cool. So interesting. I mean, I can barely relate. I wrote a feature on John Mack last year. And it took me about three, I was really engulfed in the research for like three full months. And it's like not comparable yeah. at all, but it was such <laughs> a fun journey that I can like really only imagine what a journey the 16 years might've been. But you know, it's, it's really interesting. You mentioned all these kind of like connections to your personal life and work with John Mack, because here at Psychedelics Today, I also think we kind of feel that way in a, in a, in a way to John Mack as well. And I won't, you know, Stan Groff's work is a really big reason why Joe and Kyle started this uh, podcast. Absolutely. Uh, I, um, I actually, I spent, yeah, a lot of time talking to Stan, <gasps> uh, for my cool. book. Um, and he was very helpful. And, uh, as I say in the book at, at, at some length, uh, Stan Groff was really responsible uh, for getting John Mack interested uh, in the whole field. Yeah, could you tell us a little um, bit about that story? Sure. So, um, just to set the stage, I mean, John John Mack had had been uh, uh, working on, on, on a bunch of social causes and uh, issues in in Cambridge at Harvard. He was not doing anything particularly spiritual. He, uh, he was not thinking about anomalous, you know, uh, events. Uh, I'll talk about his background, uh, maybe later, fill that in a little bit. But at one point he, um, he went out to Esalen, uh, you know, that great psychic think tank on the <laughs> Pacific. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and he, uh, and that's where he met Stan Groff. And Stan was out there working with uh, Dennis Murphy. And, and John heard about Stan's uh, holotropic breathwork. And John Mack being open to all kinds of 
uh, unusual experiences, including experimentation with LSD. We'll get that right off the table now. Uh, he was oh, yeah. <laughs> very uh, interested in the effects of psychotropic drugs and uh, later on ayahuasca and other substances. Mm. So anyway, um, but he was very interested in, in Stan's idea that by, by regulated breathing, you could really uh, precipitate yourself into altered states of consciousness without drugs. Although Stan was a, also a great experimenter in LSD, as you probably know. Anyway, uh, but this was drug-free. He would uh, teach people to uh, relax, control their breathing to, to music. And eventually, um, they would go into a, an altered state. And, and John tried this, and sure enough, first he, he felt nothing, and he was wondering, you know, when is this going to work, and this is silly. <laughs> and suddenly, he found himself born back to uh, his childhood, and he was actually, he felt himself in the womb, and his mother was, mm. you know, pushing him out and turning blue in the birth process, very um, realistic, very visceral kind of, uh, you know, uh, sensation he felt and um and then he felt suddenly he was in medieval russia uh and uh, a mongol warrior was decapitating his son <laughs> were very traumatic uh, uh i won't say memory but a, certainly a, a he was plunged into that that reality and um and then he he came out of it when you know everybody uh sort of woke up from their altered state and everybody was comparing experiences. There were Russians there who uh, also had uh, interesting experiences. So, um, so that was one big thing that happened to, to John. He was, he was awakened to a different world, the spiritual world, uh, a world of other realities than the one he was familiar with. So, um, and as I say in my book, uh, Stan Groff, uh, you know, sort of opened up, he said, Stan Groff opened up my psyche and the UFOs flew in. <laughs> uh, that's a great quote. Uh, so that great. sort of paved the way. So Stan was a great influence on him. And um, for many years after that, uh, John would return for breathwork sessions in Canada, and, you know, wherever Stan was giving them. Uh, in California and in Van Vancouver, uh, an island near Vancouver. So uh, it was it was a big influence on John. And Stan would say things like, you know, never mind aliens. You know, where does this table come from? Hmm. Where does this chair come from? Where does anything come from? And that, of course, is the is the central question of of the cosmos. Where does anything come from? Hmm. So, uh, so Stan was a, a huge influence. Hmm. Uh, Ralph, offhand, do you know if this was the uh, that that first breathwork experience was the uh, kind of intercultural exchange thing with the Russian? It was doctors and scientists. It was yeah. exactly, and um, you know um, that was another part of of John Mack's world. He was very into. Uh, world peace and, uh, you mm. know, reaching out across the, what was then the Iron Curtain. And, you know, we, we can talk about that. But, you know, you reminded me of something else. Even before um, this breathwork uh, awakening that John Mack had, there was something else that happened with Stan Groff that I have in my book. Um, and, and that is this. Uh, when they met at Esalen, Stan gave uh, John Mack a chapter from a book he was putting together called Spiritual Emergency. <laughs> um, and it was mm -hmm. a book about uh, transformations in life and, uh, um, you know, sp sp spiritual awakenings, etc. And the chapter that Stan gave John was by Keith Thompson, who was a very brilliant uh, psychoanalyst. Um, and uh, Keith Thompson had looked at the alien abduction syndrome and said, in effect, look, there's no way we're going to figure out what's behind this really strange, you know, phenomenon. But uh, at least we can sort of track the effect it's had on people. 
the transformation it caused people. So these people are called phenomenologists because they say, let's just exam- examine the phenomenon for the effect it has on people. Let's not try to figure out if it's real or not. So, mm-hmm. uh, so he wrote this chapter uh, all about the changes people went through who had had alien abduction experiences. So John Mack read that chapter that Stan gave him and said, gee, you know, <laughs> this is so strange. Are these, are these events real? I mean, are they really mm-hmm. aliens? Are they re- people really <laughs> getting, you know, abducted by aliens? And then, you mm-hmm. know, of course, there's the, the kind of cop out if you want to see it that way. That well, we don't know, but here's the here's the transformative part of the experience. So maybe that's a cop out. Maybe that's the only way we can deal with it. But that was John's first introduction to the to the subject. And then he did the holotropic breathing. And then something else happened um, at Esalen. He met uh, a, a, another psychotherapist. Uh, her name was Blanche Chavosti, who said she had a patient who um, believed she was abducted, basically. She uh, felt the um, aliens had uh, planted, give, you know, planted implants into her body and were tracking her. And so Blanche, this other psychotherapist, was really into that and started telling John Mack about it. And he thought that was completely crazy, you know, (laughs) aliens, you know, abducting people, planting implants in their bodies. And so uh, Blanche said uh, to John, listen, uh, I have a friend named Bud Hopkins, uh, who's an Mm. artist who's studying these people, and maybe you'd like to meet him. And John said, no way, that's crazy. I mean, the people have got to be crazy, but Hopkins has got to be crazy. I mean, who, who believes in this stuff? <laughs> so this was kind of the threshold in, in John Mack's life uh, because he, he dismissed it out of hand. And then something else happened that brought him into contact with Bud Hopkins. So now we've zeroed in on, you know, the transformative moment in his life. Yeah. Beautiful. No, thank you for telling that story. I think it's so fascinating. So many key players. Oh, Esalen. Oh, so right. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you you briefly touch on this idea that alien abductees, or when John worked with <laughs> alien experiencers, sorry, I know that's what they prefer mm. to be called, that he helped them come to this kind of transformative or, you know, he helped them kind of fully remember and process. We would call this in the psychedelic world, like integrate their alien abductee experiences. And then, and then that really led to like a really big transformation for a lot of people. And to us here in the psychedelic community, it reminds us a lot of psychedelic assisted therapy, I think, Mm. but I was hoping you could just dig in a little into like what some of those transformations were for people. Yeah. Well, uh, you put your finger on something particularly important because, uh, John, (laughs) although there were other people like Bud Hopkins uh, studying alien abduction experiences, uh, John was particularly uh, adamant that the people he saw uh, were transformed by the experience. Not everybody, maybe, but a lot of them. That the experience Mm. was not only traumatic, as uh, Bud Hopkins and another uh, researcher they were associated with, David Jacobs, mm-hmm. felt that uh, they certainly emphasized Hopkins and Jacobs the the traumatic aspect of the of the abduction experiences. Anyway, John felt that along with the trauma, uh, these people were awakened to uh, environmental consciousness that they felt as responsibility mm-hmm. for the future of the planet that they um, felt sort of the cosmic love permeating, you know, the universe. Uh, They -hmm. felt sometimes uh, almost a love for the alien beings they encountered. Mm. And uh, and, uh, they felt particularly spiritual and close to the source or God or whatever they wanted to call it, something divine. So uh, this was kind of an awakening uh, that that John Mack... uh, uh, noticed, I guess, in in the people he was uh, working with. And that set him apart, as I said, from people like uh, uh, Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, who saw the alien experience as as largely, almost completely traumatic, 
aliens were evil, they were stealing our DNA, creating a hybrid race. And it was, and to, and to their thinking, it was happening uh, in, in a recognizable reality. These were very real experiences. And John Mack wasn't so sure about that. They were real to the people. They were happening in some reality that, that was real to them, but it was not necessarily a reality uh, that we could recognize. Maybe it was a parallel reality or something like that. So that was the big difference. But John, to answer your question in a long roundabout way, uh, John was, was definitely um, caught up in the, transfor- the transformative aspects of, of this phenomenon. No, I love that. That was just what I was looking for. I think for me as someone who's just really deep in psychedelic research, that aspect of it was what made this so interesting to me because there's a lot of parallels, um, in my opinion, between what John Mack was doing, helping abductees, you know, process this experience and what psychedelic therapists do, you know, at Johns Hopkins and an Imperial College London giving psilocybin to, you know, depressed patients and stuff. That's how it seems to help them get over their depression in a way, but these big transformative experiences and this connection to the source and that we have to take better care of mother nature. It's like almost a cliche lesson from a mushroom trip or an ayahuasca ceremony. So I find it all very fascinating there's definitely a connection here (laughs) right definitely and i mean drugs i mean psychedelics were a part of john's life uh uh, as i as i wrote in the book he was sometimes angry at his wife sally because john wrote at one point in his journal uh i wanted to a a group of friends uh, uh, uh wanted to get together to partake of um, substances, as he put it, substances, <laughs> but Sally wouldn't participate. So, um, he, uh, you know, uh, he was very close to his wife in many ways, uh, but they, um, they they were different people in, in, in other ways. And John was always experimenting. And um, uh, one of the things he <laughs> experimented with was uh, LSD and marijuana and later ayahuasca. He was just open to those experiences. So um, it's not an accident that, you know, the language he used, the transformative language he used, and what you're describing in, you know, psychedelic therapy uh, is kind of similar. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I find it all super fascinating. And I did find that thread in your book about the rift between him and Sally so relatable in a way mm. and just so human and uh, and tragic in a way too. No, but oh, just so interesting. Everyone has to read this book. It's so freaking good. <laughs> but so I guess, I, you know, th- you touched on this other big idea, John Max, just now that perhaps alien abductions are happening, but not in this dimension or not in this reality. And it's a really interesting John Mack theory that really does set him apart from like the UFO community. Um, But I feel like it's kind of at odds with some of your reporting, Ralph, um, because you were one of the reporters who broke that big uh, UFO story in 2007, right? Right. And I, I guess I was hoping you could tell our listeners a little bit about what that story is, and then maybe get into your own theories on the reality of UFOs. (laughs) Well, um, okay, I'll I'll tell you what I can. Maybe we start with the science. Okay, (laughs) Uh, so the the article we wrote in the New York Times was 2017, December 2017. And the article was this. Leslie Kane, who was my collaborator, was somebody who's a huge expert on, on UFOs, investigative reporter who wrote a book on um, generals and pilots and and government leaders who have all spoken out about UFOs. Uh, As I said, her book is kind of a landmark. I came across her when I was doing my research into John Mack, and uh, we became friends. And uh, in 2017, she told me she had uh, gone to a meeting of intelligence uh, people high-level intelligence uh, figures in Washington uh, and learned uh, from them that there was a secret Pentagon office or agency uh, called ATIP, the um, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, uh, that had been set up to monitor 
UFO encounters between Navy pilots and Navy ships and UFOs. Hmm. It had been set up, uh, she found out, in 2007 with a $22 million appropriation from the Democratic Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, but it was a secret and um, it had never been you know, mentioned. <clears throat> and this was discussed at the meeting that Leslie attended in Washington. And a present at the meeting was the head of that office, Luis Elizondo. And uh, Elizondo uh, revealed that he had just submitted his resignation to the Defense Department because he didn't feel he was getting enough support. So this was, you know, really interesting news that, first of all, there was a secret Pentagon office monitoring UFOs. And officially, you know, the government got out of the UFO business uh, with Project Blue Book in 1969 because there was nothing, nothing to see here, folks. You know, move on. Nothing to see here. Uh, so now we find that not only didn't the government not get out of it, but it's it, there was in a whole office uh, involved in monitoring UFO activity with Navy uh, vessels and aircraft and Air Force planes. And the guy was quitting because he wasn't getting enough support. So uh, Leslie came to me. Uh, I, I agreed it was a great story. We took it to the New York Times where I was a contributing writer. I had actually officially left the staff after 45 years in, in uh, 2009, but I maintained my contacts there and continued to write as a non-staffer. So we took that story to editors there, explained that we had the whole story on the record. There were no anonymous sources. We had the documents. We had the people speaking out their names in the story. And the Times agreed it was a great story, put it on the front page on a Sunday. December 17, 2017, and uh, uh, we also put out on the Times webpage uh, some of the Navy videos yeah. showing these objects flying around Navy planes and um, uh, ra- caught on radar. So wow. um, it, it was hard to deny that this was a real phenomenon, uh, actually, and that the mainstream media, namely the New York Times, was acknowledging it. So that, that's the story. And we, we did some follow-up stories where we took the story a little bit further. Uh, we interviewed some of the pilots themselves, uh, one of whom saw an object emerging from the water or going into what? the water, which added a whole new dimension, literally, to this UFO <laughs> thing. So they weren't only flying in the skies, they were operating underwater. Stop. And then uh, (laughs) we did a story about how uh, members of Congress or congressional committees were briefed on possible materials that the government had recovered. This remains a very classified subject. We couldn't really get to the bottom of it, but at least we we reported that there were briefings for congressional committees about uh, certain materials research. So uh, the three stories together... Uh, really moved the needle, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say. The government has become much more forthcoming since then. You know, things have happened to you know, bring, the, bring the government more into, into the light on this. They're acknowledging more and more. They're encouraging pilots and sailors to report these encounters. Um, now there's the uh, unidentified uh, the, um, UAP task force, uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon task force that which is a successor to ATIP that's supposedly going to report to the public in coming months. Mm. They may need more time, but uh, they'll, they'll, they have to do it according to c- congressional mandate. So a lot has changed. So influential, this work. Oh, so exciting. I, uh, wow. Thank you for your work, mm. Ralph. That's so cool. Well. <laughs> Ralph, I'm curious if you received any pushback from the Times when you're trying to put this material out. Well, I got to say that, you know, the Internet being what it is, there's been a lot of chatter on the Internet about uh, what we were doing uh, in terms of the stories we were pursuing. Uh, they had actually gotten away of our reporting uh, because it was very hard mm-hmm. to call people after after um, <clears throat> and there was widespread speculation uh, who we were calling, what we were looking for. So it's very hard to do this kind of reporting, uh, you know, with people nibbling at your heels and and uh, you know showering you and and everyone else with speculation. 
So one of the stories that started circulating was that the Times was uh, not um, not enthusiastic about the reporting, or that they were, you know, being difficult. And I, I want to say that, that um, the Times is doing what every publication, every editor I've ever dealt with does, which is make sure that the reporting was solid that uh, we had had backup for everything we were saying. The story went through a lot, all the stories we wrote went through a lot of uh, back and forth with editors and never, never hostile, never putting obstacles in our way, but only aimed at getting, you know, the best possible story out, which is what editors do. And especially editors at the New York times. So, um, and because this was such a controversial subject uh, for mainstream media, for anybody, they were being extra careful. I understand that. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. So we dealt with it. We dealt with all the questions, and uh, not everything we we gathered got into the paper, but it never does because uh, you always you know winnow down a story to what's uh, absolutely uh, provable and what you have yeah. the evidence for. So uh, it was part of the process, and uh, I think the Times, to its credit, uh, uh, you know the, the stories. Um, they held up, they, you know, the, the thrust of the stories was never challenged. Uh, other people followed in our footsteps with, you know, other stories. So, uh, you know, I, I think the Times was, was absolutely correct in the way it handled things. And uh, we're going back to them now with, with more reporting. Mm. Mm, outstanding. Very exciting. So in terms of legacy from, from John Mack, like certainly he, he put himself on the line with Harvard, like that event at MIT and like a lot more. Like, do you think he had like a, like a pretty substantial influence outside the world of, uh, you know, UFO research? Well, um, you know, I, he was very well known in his day and mm. since his death, you know, 25 years ago and <laughs> more, wow. I think, uh, his, his legacy has faded. I think, uh, not that many people, know about him today, which maybe is good for me in my book, that I'm reintroducing him to Mm -hmm. a new audience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's hard to say uh, what his legacy was. Um, Look, it remains a mystery. And it's no spoiler uh, to to say that my book does not provide the answer to the (laughs) the mystery of alien abduction. Uh, And I acknowledge that. I shed some light on it, uh, perhaps. And what I like to say is that at least I can, I'm comfortable saying that I know what it isn't. Uh, it's not mm-hmm. mental illness. Uh, it's not uh, hoaxes by and large. It's not fabrication. It's not, you know, the delusion of crowds. Uh, it's something else. It's something that is very real to a lot of people from different walks of life, different ages. And there really is no good explanation for what, what has happened to these people. Uh, but at least, That's better than what the so-called skeptics and debunkers say, which is they reject it out of hand and say, well, I know what this is. This is uh, a sleep paralysis. Well, it doesn't only happen at night. Uh, This is, uh, you know, mental illness. This is uh, uh, people looking for attention. Well, they're not looking for attention. Most of them are trying to avoid attention. And besides, uh, what do you say about the, the, you know, the two-year-old children who tell these stories, you know, little man fly me up in the sky, I go up in the sky. Uh, you know, these two-year-old kids, uh, have they read uh, UFO books? Uh, are they influenced by UFO movies? It's very strange. And that, of course, brings up the whole aerial school case mm. where school children in, in Zimbabwe reported this UFO landing and interactions with two uh, little, little men who, who came out. So, and that's one of the most credible cases around. So anyway, it's certainly a mystery still, but it's not anything that anyone has, has easily explained away. Mm. Right. It's, it's, I think obnoxious to us in the psychedelic and uh, UFO world when kind of rationalist positivists, I guess, or mm. like post positivists come to the picture. I guess scientism is the, that delineation now and just totally rule these things out and say they understand reality when they don't necessarily, I haven't spent much time looking at these topics. Right. Uh, no, that's one of my pet peeves that the uh, so-called um, 
skeptics have not taken the time to read the literature. Uh, they don't know the cases. So uh, all they can do is say, ah, it's ridiculous. Of course it's ridiculous. We all agree it's ridiculous. We all agree <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> you know, I, um, the, epi the epigram in my book that I have, you know, in the beginning of the book, a uh, quote, Sir William Crookes, who was a famous scientist in England in the 1870s, and he was sent to debunk uh, some paranormal activities that were going on, including seances and levitation and musical instruments that were playing uh, themselves in a locked cabinet. And he, mm. he witnessed all this, and, and uh, the people who sent him expected him to come back and say it was all a hoax or you know it was all trickery. But instead, he came out and said, "I can't, you know, debunk this. This all seemed to be real to me." And then he had a famous quote, which I use in my book. He said, uh, "I never said it was possible. I only said it was true." Mm. And uh, I, I love, love that, that because you know we all agree that these stories that people are telling. Are, are not possible in our reality. They're, they're, they're completely crazy. And yet there's no easy way to explain them away. So true. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess I keep wondering, and when I was reading about John Mack and reading your book um, last fall, I kept thinking like, I wonder if John Mack's ideas would be more accepted today. You know, we are in the middle of this psychedelic research renaissance. Your reporting on UFOs is going to turn three or four years old soon. Mm. Like the world is changing. It's getting a little bit more open to weird and transpersonal experiences in a way. And I even think Harvard itself has all these psychedelic studies and everything. Well, that's so I a guess good I point, wonder. Uh, yeah, like, what do you yeah. think? Do you think he'd be more, like his ideas would be more accepted in 2021? Well, <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure much more accepted, but I mean, Harvard was no stranger to strange research. As I say in my mm -hmm. book, William mm -hmm. James, the father of psychology, was you know uh, <laughs> right. involved in seances and, and, and other you know, paranormal research a hundred years ago, and, and he's a big hero at Harvard. Hmm. And now, of course, we have Avi Loeb uh, in, in the uh, astronomy department there. He actually crossed paths with John Mack in the 90s there at Harvard. And he's saying that the scientific establishment is too quick to dismiss uh, his theory that the um, uh, object that came into our solar system uh, uh, in 2017, about the time we wrote our article, was um, an int intelligently controlled. It was not an asteroid. It was... Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Oumuamua, you know, the strange uh, thing he says was... Um, it, it changed its trajectory, it changed its speed in ways that showed it was not a natural object. Now, other scientists have taken sharp issue with him but he's, um, he provides some of the same you know, story at Harvard that John Mack did of bucking the establishment and, mm -hmm. um, and saying the science is too quick to, uh, to close its eyes to unconventional research. Interesting. Yeah, I remember that story. Is that the same asteroid or like, you know, it was like too shiny to be an asteroid? Is it? Well, I that's remember. right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, he said it, that it, it, it um, see, nobody has a picture of this thing. And the pictures that have appeared in the paper and elsewhere are artists' uh, drawings. Um, mm. No, mm. You know, the thing was, it was detected on instruments, but it was never uh, pictured. It was never captured on, in, in any image. So everyone... Uh, looking at this thing is imagining the shape. So one of the shapes that Avi Loeb says it it has is thin, like a disc, which would accord with our idea of UFOs. And um, it, it was very, very thin, and it had a solar sail attached to it, which actually used a solar power to to propel it, you know, through the solar system uh, and through the universe. That was its power source, a solar sail. <laughs> but we don't know what it looked like. So, you know, I think a lot of people are influenced by this drawing somebody put out of a rock. You know, I said, well, that just looks like a rock. Uh, <laughs> but, but nobody knows. And you're right. It, 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 was, it seemed to be bright uh, by the measurements of it, not by any image mm, that was taken. Okay. And the brightness might have been because it was using the solar power to, to uh, propel it. 
Oh, so interesting. I guess Loeb just put out a book on this. Yeah, thing. Uh, extraterrestrial, yeah. and uh, uh, he got quite quite a bit of attention. You know, pushback too. So you know, it's, you ask whether what kind of a reception John Mack would have today. It's really hard to tell. Uh, yes, there's more uh, you know, open p- people are more open to you know UFOs because of you know what's come out in the last few years, including the Navy videos. But I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> He would be, you know, entirely welcome today as a Harvard psychiatrist who, who was enthusiastic, which he was, about uh, uh, you know alien abduction stories. Mm. Mm. <laughs> really curious about this idea of possible multiple realities, and and Mac I think talked about this a little bit. So, like, and I, I talked to some uh, people diagnosed with schizophrenia in the in the recent past and. And they they had some really interesting kind of activist things to say about uh, this concept of targeted individuals, Mm -hmm. like uh, people who think the governments are, you know, blasting microwaves into their brain to control it, you know, this kind of talk track and how that that's a real experience for them. But like there's kind of a schism between our experience of that and theirs. Well, yeah, I mean, that raises the whole question of who are these people who have these experiences now, mm-hmm. John Mack found that they were not distinguished by any uh, particular demographic. I mean, it, you know, there was not people who had sexual abuse histories. It was not people, you know, who had, from any particular background. It was a real cross-section of people. Nothing distinguished them. They were professionals. They were blue-collar people. They were young, old. Well, the one thing that seemed interesting is that it's, it appeared to run in families, that if if mm. somebody was abducted, the chances are that his or her mother and grandparents are abducted, and the kids would, would be abducted or were being abducted for some reason. And and that raised the whole question of, of what, what might explain, uh, what brain function, let's say, might explain their uh, attraction to to the aliens if they're if they're aliens whatever this this phenomenon was uh, what was it that that these people were, were sending out uh, if 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 they were that attracted them that made them targets mm. so you know maybe there's some brain function i shouldn't say brain i should say mind because the brain is an organ and the mind is bigger than the brain the mind is something that may transcend the body and you know, uh, 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 intermingle or be in touch with the the entire cosmos. I mean, um, people die; they have brain death, and yet um, there's stories that the, the they later on, if they're brought back to life, they remember things. So it was not the brain; uh, it was it was the mind or the spirit that had a, a larger connection to the universe. So you know, what is it that in in, in people's bodies? Um, or or psyches that make them attractive uh, to these experiences. That's that's a really good angle on the mystery. And again, it it, it's, it, it hasn't been answered. Mm. So interesting. A really interesting aspect of John Mack's work I'd like to bring up is. You know, didn't John Mack not only explore alien experiences within like Western culture, but as his research progressed, I understand that he was also looking at like indigenous and native people's experiences with like star people and what we would through the Western lens view as UFOs or aliens, perhaps, but we're more part of like this spiritual tradition of some people, um, you know, native people. Um, Could you talk to us a little bit about that aspect of John's work? Yeah, he he was very um, he did travel widely uh, in Brazil, in Africa, Australia, and he found that uh, in many cultures had a tradition of uh, interactions with um, star people, or whatever they called it in that tradition. <clears throat> yeah, and they were comfortable with that tradition. In other words, they weren't as hung up as we were on oh, they're aliens from you know what planet do they come from? Uh, indigenous cultures, in particular, seem to accept that they uh, were, had been visited for thousands of years by, mm. uh, you know, uh, presences from, from another spiritual domain. And there was no um, 
uh, what's the word? There, there was there was nothing wrong with it. There was no uh, program attached to it. It was just part of their culture, and and he tuned into that. He was very interested in that, and he investigated these traditions in, in different parts of the world, particularly Brazil, as I said, and uh, South Africa, and um, and he and he said that we're the ones who are hung up. Um, <laughs> You know that that we don't accept it. That we have all these blocks to understanding that. But uh, other cultures, particularly the, the shamanic uh, uh, histories of animal uh, presences, uh, because you know a lot of the abduction experiences seem to involve animals. People say that they, you know, they be, they became aware of a deer in the road or an owl uh, flew yeah. into the car. And uh, later, under hypnosis, or as they, you know, their memories were probed, it became clear that somehow it was mixed up with an alien abduction experience. Uh, so, uh, and the, sh- the shamans uh, always knew that animal presences uh, seemed to um, uh, embody powers of, you know, that operate in different dimensions and uh, shape shifting. You know, the Navajo shape shifters come up at Skinwalker Ranch. So, um, you know, he did really range far and wide and not only in alien abduction, by the way, uh, he had many other interests later on. He realized that alien abduction was really one aspect of paranormal experience, but there were, there were others, um, you know, Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, uh, crop circles, uh, cattle mutilation, and afterlife experiences. There were all these strange things going on that may or may not be related, but uh, alien abduction was not the only, uh, you know, paranormal mystery. Mm, Exactly. No, I think that's how we feel, or that's how I feel as someone in the psychedelic community wanting to spread this word that psychedelics aren't the only kind of paranormal kind of anomalous experience that there's, they're kind of, can I feel like they're connected and there's so many different kinds and they're all weirdly so similar. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for going into that. Yeah. yeah. When John Mack, uh, actually, uh, in, um, I think it was when he took ayahuasca, he had this strange, um, dream of all the gods uh, had been you know pushed into one space and they were all drinking from this trough and it was very real to him what he what he experienced uh, on one of his you know psychedelic trips so um uh, <laughs> He would be very interested in your group. <laughs> oh, I wish. I know. If I could only pick John Mack's brain. Well, oh. you know, uh, <laughs> funny you mention that because at the end of my book, I talk about how people uh, reported seeing his spirit after he oh, died. Yeah. Mm. And um, uh, that was one aspect that really struck me in, in researching the book, that people uh, reported experiences Uh, with him after he died. And of course, that was the time in his life when he was interested in researching uh, afterlife experiences and survival of consciousness. And I tell some of those stories in the book, and they're really haunting, literally haunting. (laughs) I remember. uh, (laughs) um, But I, I, you know, I, I do say that I don't vouch for those stories the way I vouch for other stuff in the book, uh, which is more uh, checkable, let's say. Um, uh, yeah, as a reporter, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah you got to be careful. Just- <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, these people um, who were close to John Mack, who were really uh, felt that he had appeared to them and they had conversations with him and uh, you know, not just one person, but a number of people uh, came up. So, um, again, part of the mystery. Hmm. Incredible. Yeah. You know, I, this kind of reminds me of another topic. This could be a little out of your wheelhouse. You just let me know. It's totally Mm -hmm. okay. But, uh, so I came across some, I actually contacted, um, Will at John Max archives Mm -hmm. when I was writing my article and he sent me some really fascinating correspondence that John Mack had with some like visionaries in the psychedelic community in the nineties, especially Mm -hmm. like Terrence McKenna Mm -hmm. and Rick Strassman. Mm -hmm. And I guess I wanted to ask you first if you knew anything more about, yeah, Rick Strassman and John Max 
relationship because if you don't know that much about Rick's research he researched DMT right. um, in the 90s he was one of the first scientists to get approval to do DMT studies right and like half of his participants had entity encounters on DMT like aliens right. or right. other and I guess I wonder do you know anything about John Mack's thoughts on DMT entities or your own thoughts on that world? <laughs> well, I, I delved into yeah. a little bit uh, in, in my research and I read Strassman's book, uh, you know, The Spirit yeah. Molecule and um, Terence McKenna's idea that, you know, Earth was populated by, what's it called? Uh, polyspermia Spores. or whatever that uh, oh yeah uh, panspermia panspermia <laughs> right uh well, you know all intriguing theories because you know we don't really know how life started on earth we you know we think we know uh, maybe some scientists think they know but um but rick strassman's you know theories are uh are really interesting and he had you know the same kind of uh, spiritual encounters uh with um uh, you know uh, the drug that uh that mac Mac had in his way, and um, and the shamans, of course, uh, often take psychedelic substances when they, uh, you know, tra- transport themselves into these other uh, states of consciousness. And um, I mean, this has a venerable history going back to the Greeks. You know, the Oracle of Delphi and um, uh, and the, the old whole the whole tradition of uh, uh, you know ancient seers and fortune tellers and. Uh, magic so um uh you know it didn't start with john mack obviously yeah yeah absolutely Mm. now what what maybe ralph surprised you the most in your 16 years of john mack research was there a whole mess of stuff or was it like was there maybe a couple stories well i was um well we'll talk about the synchronicities which surprised me uh but also when I read some of his case studies, uh, because um, he, he was very serious about uh, his research, he didn't just grab onto a theory. Uh, he started collecting mm. these um, experiencers to research them himself after he met Bud Hopkins. And what convinced him, John, uh, that he was onto something was the, the quality of the stories that, that some people told him. And there was one case in particular that, that stands out that, that surprised me and uh, certainly uh, what, what seemed powerful. Um, there were two girls that John Mack interviewed who, uh, who years before had had a sleepover together when they were younger. And during the night, they noticed a, a UFO outside the window. They saw what they thought was a UFO outside the window. Uh, later that night, the mother of uh, one of the girls who ha- was hosting the sleepover went down to check on the girls and found them missing. They were not in their beds. Mm. So she called the police, and the police searched everywhere for them, couldn't find them. And a few hours later, they turned up back in their beds. Wow. And that case was particularly interesting because it involved witnesses. And the mother uh, who... who verified that she came down to check and uh, the girls were missing and then they turned up back in their beds later and and the girls themselves uh, under you know hypnosis and also consciously to some extent remembered an abduction experience connected with the ufo so that was an unusually powerful case of um of, you know witness corroboration Mm. There was another case cited in this uh, MIT conference I talk about at the beginning of my book in 1992. MIT hosted a conference of um, uh, experts from various fields, atomic physicists, psychologists, folklorists, theologians, who were all looking at abduction from different points of view, trying to figure it out. And this is a very high-level conference. It was secret at the time. They later came out with a transcript, which is one of the things that uh, – the, uh, skeptics should read before they dismiss it all. And one of the stories told at the conference was of a woman who was with her husband when she fainted. And uh, later she said she imagined herself flying up into the sky and having all these uh, experiences uh, in the universe. Uh, but her husband said he was holding her body there. So mm. uh, she, physically she was there, but mentally she was off. Uh, you know, in the cosmos. And that also became a powerful 
anecdote because it showed that at least in some cases, the body can be stationary and the mind can travel. Mm. So that, that kind of blew my mind. And, um, and then of course the whole Ariel school case that, you know, we mentioned earlier uh, that John rushed to uh, Zimbabwe in Southern Africa to investigate, uh, he was under investigation at Harvard. Um, then it was in the middle of that committee inquiry that he heard about this case and uh, he dropped everything and flew off to, um, to Zimbabwe with his partner at the time, a, a woman named Dominique. And, uh, it turned out that during a recess one day at the school, uh, 60 children were playing in the yard and they saw all of them later reported they saw a um, object land and two little men got out uh, dressed in child size beings you know dressed in kind of a uniform and with with mesmerizing dark eyes like rugby balls and mm. they interacted with the kids they didn't abduct the kids but they they sent telepathic messages to the kids and the kids felt bad for the these creatures, and they felt they, they got messages that they should take better care of the earth, and that they uh, needed <laughs> to, uh, you know, all the things that we talked about before, connecting with the source, and they they uh, it, uh, sort of had transformative messages of what they should should do with their lives, and. Um, they drew pictures afterwards of what these beings looked like and the spaceship looked like, and some of the pictures are in my book. And John Mack got these children on tape and, uh, you know, uh, uh, on camera. So uh, it's pretty hard to argue with 60 kids telling basically the same story, uh, and they were different ages, you know, looked like 9, 10, 11, and uh, they submitted to a lot of interviews. It's a very famous case. Uh, so that blew my mind. So you're asking what, you know, what resonated mm. <laughs> with me. That's another case that did. That's fascinating. Um, I just want to quickly, uh, for the listeners, there's a great new documentary on the Ariel School uh, case. It's called The Phenomena phenomenon. And uh, they also interview the kids again who are now in their 30s and they still, you know, are saying the same story. They still really believe their experience. I think it's a fascinating documentary for anyone interested in this topic to go check it out. I really enjoyed it when I watched it. I'm not it sure it, it's out yet, Michelle. Oh, really? I, know I thought I saw it. <laughs> well, um, pieces of it are out. Randy Nickerson, who was one of uh, Mac's um, experiencers, <coughs> oh, well, um, I saw something on Amazon, so maybe you can see pieces of it, but it's coming out soon then. And, yes, um, and he, he does hope to bring I it out soon. There have been uh, really good. pieces of that documentary have circulated, and um, but uh, it definitely is worth seeing once, it, once it's out. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> hmm. Who, um, like, is actively engaged in this world, this uh, kind of UFO paranormal world that you, you think is worth uh, following up with on, on the topic? Oh, you know, um, I came across a number of people in, in the course of my work. Some of them are, are old now. I mean, David Jacobs is retired. He's no longer doing it. Bud Hopkins died. There are other um, psychiatrists who are still seeing patients. There are, there are abductee uh, therapy groups where they get together and talk about their experiences and, you know, compare notes. So uh, I, they're working with, with different people. I don't know who they are necessarily. I, I, I know how to reach some of the groups, but uh, there's definitely still research going on. And there are definitely abductees out there who are still uh, talking about their experiences, maybe not publicly, but in, in, in groups, because this is not something that people are proud of particularly. You know, that was mm -hmm. another the, the widespread misconception that these people are dying to tell their stories. They want to make a lot of money. They want to, you know, publicize their stories and go on. They don't. <laughs> they don't. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're desperately embarrassed. They don't know how to explain this to their friends and family, uh, neighbors. Um, mm -hmm. uh, some of them told John Mack after he, he, he listened to their stories and said, you know, I think something happened to you. I can't explain it, but I think something real happened. And they said, Oh my God, I was hoping you would tell me I was insane because th <laughs> that would be easier to accept. You know, if he'd said you, you're going right. crazy, that's why you have these experiences. But 
they, they would have almost wanted that uh, more than um, to hear that, yeah, they had been contacted by alien intelligence and, uh, and uh, abducted to a, uh, a craft and they had their uh, sperm and eggs taken for a hybrid race. I mean, that's a right. lot to deal with. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like how tortured Whitley Strieber is, is a great example. Absolutely. Like he does not look like a happy person. Absolutely. You've got the right word, tortured. He's a wonderful person. I've talked to him many times. I was on his show a couple of weeks ago. Mm. And he is one of the examples, by the way, of, of uh, how unruly this phenomenon is. It doesn't fit into a neat uh, narrative. There's a core narrative that basically, mm. you know, uh, sums up the, the most common stories, let's say. But then there are many stories that don't quite fit, and Whitley's is one of them. Uh, he had a lot of experiences that don't fit the normal normal, <laughs> I shouldn't say normal, that don't fit the uh, common narrative that, you know, comes up so often, Be getting beamed, you know, seeing a UFO, getting beamed through your walls and windows to a craft and, you know, being subject to various medical, pseudo-medical procedures. But there are many experiences that don't fit that. And that was one of the quarrels that other psychotherapists had with Mac, that he focused, or he seemed to be focusing on this core narrative, whereas um, a lot of uh, other you know, people who reported this didn't have the reproductive experience, for example. Mm -hmm. So some people said, you see, what, what you should really be focusing on, or at least including in the research, are the people who don't have these experiences, or who don't have the experiences that fit. Those are the people who are more interesting. Uh, because why doesn't their experience fit? What does it say about the experience that it's different from all the other experiences? Um, so it's sort of mystery piled on mystery. Yeah. Could it be another mm. species of alien? <laughs> Maybe, you know. Uh, That's a talk track for um, sure. There is, I, I just became aware of a book. I haven't read it yet, but, you know, some woman who has made contact or says she has made contact with these uh, more than 100 different alien races uh, and she mm. delineates them. So Barbara Lamb, one of uh, uh, John Mack's collaborators, who told me a story about the uh, feeling of seeing his presence after he died, uh, she had an experience herself, she told me, of encountering a reptilian, and that's one of the stories that keeps circulating in the abduction uh, area, that some of these beings assume reptilian forms like giant insects. I don't ask me why <laughs> or how, but that's one of the experiences that people uh, recount. So, as I said, mystery piled on mystery. Mm. Right. The way you phrased something earlier, like these um, kind of even more anomalous experiences, kind of don't fit neatly with this kind of bell curve concept right. that a lot of scientists want to work with, right? Like, oh, it's a fringe case, so we don't have to think about right. it. Or like... Uh, you know, that's not really the thing we're looking for, right? Right, and it's the it's the tendency, I think, of all researchers, and including and writers like myself, uh, who tend to reject things that don't fit the pattern because <laughs> it's too hard to deal with. So it's easy to write about, you know, all the cases that seem to be similar, and then when something uh, crops up that's uh, really completely bizarre, you don't know how to deal with it, so you reject it. So well, I'm not going to deal with that. So I'll give you an example. A very famous uh, Nobel Prize winning chemist named Carrie Mullis, mm -hmm. who died about two years ago. Uh, not a Pulitzer Prize winner, but a Nobel Prize winner. Oof. Anyway, <laughs> he, uh, he, he wrote a book and he told this experience. He was coming back to his cabin in Mendocino, California one night, and um, he had a check on something in the backyard or whatever. He took a flashlight and uh, walked uh, into the woods and uh, he shined his flashlight on something and it turned out to be a raccoon with glowing eyes. And the raccoon then spoke to him and said, good evening, doctor. <laughs> the next thing he knew, it was morning. Uh, he was on the road. Uh, his clothes were dry somehow. He, he hadn't slept in the, in the fields. The flashlight had disappeared. Uh, he never knew how he got there uh, and what happened in the missing time. So he was telling his daughter the experience, and she said the same thing happened to her. Uh, she found herself on the road one night. Uh, she didn't know how she got there. And um, uh, that's the story he told. He was not abducted as far as he knows. Uh, there was no more to the story. 
and uh, clearly it doesn't fit the you know the core narrative of, of abduction. And yet uh, he's an, uh, obviously a credible source because he's a Nobel Prize winning chemist. He's not insane because he was smart enough to develop this process to replicate the you know DNA uh, to win a Nobel Prize. And uh, and that's his that's his story. It begins and ends there. There's nothing more to it. Uh, he can't explain it, and uh, that's a perfect example of a story that doesn't fit, and yet uh, is um, is as true as the other stories. Mm. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I I really need to read his book. I'm told it's uh, quite the wild yeah. ride. Dancing naked in the in the mind field. It's a, it's a strange book. He, he was a real character. Uh, and by the way, a, a devotee of, of uh, psychedelic drugs, uh, which he, I believe, uh, made no uh, bones about. He uh, uh, he did try uh, experiment with with different dr- psychedelic drugs. Mm-hmm. I'll definitely have to check that book out. It's definitely been on my reading list too, and I just haven't made the time. But after that story, I just uh, I think I know what I'm doing this weekend. <laughs> you know, and also speaking of drugs, uh, there's a section of my book I talk about uh, John Mack's good friend at Harvard named Lester Grinspoon. Mm. And Lester Grinspoon wrote the first uh, really authoritative book on marijuana, uh, Marijuana Rediscovered, I believe Re- it was called. Reconsidered, I think. Pardon me? Re- reconsidered, reconsidered, I'm pretty sure. Reconsidered, you're yeah. right. Uh, came out in the <laughs> 70s, you know, way before. So, I mean, he argued for uh, legalization way back then. And mm-hmm. um, so there's two interesting things about that. One is, and I tell the story in my book, where um, he was um, he was against marijuana originally. He thought it was you know, very bad for you. And, uh, you know, he was instinctively against it. And he, he uh, came across his friend Carl Sagan, the famous uh, cosmologist. <laughs> One day, he came, who was at Harvard then, came across him uh, smoking a joint. And Lester lectured Carl Sagan and said, you know, you shouldn't be smoking that. It's very bad for you. And in this telling, uh, Sagan took the joint out and said, here, Lester, have a puff. So, <laughs> so Lester tried it. And uh, he started studying marijuana and he concluded that uh, um, he was wrong to be against it, uh, that it was uh, you know, not the danger that it was portrayed as in, in the movie um, and all that. And um, so he wrote this book, which was, as I said, way ahead of its time. So why this is particularly interesting is that um, as soon as John Mack heard about the alien abduction phenomenon from Bud Hopkins, uh, he told Lester Grinspoon about it. He said, I just heard about this amazing thing and, uh, you know, people are getting abducted by aliens. And and Lester said, have you told anybody else about this? And John said, no. And Lester says, good, don't. (laughs) And then he said, listen, um, uh, our good friend Carl Sagan, who was by then at Cornell, is coming in for a visit to Harvard uh, in a couple of days, and uh, why don't you uh, uh, meet with both of us and tell him the story? <clears throat> so Max said, sure. So they had a meeting, the three of them, and uh, John Mack is, uh, and I heard this story from Lester, by the way, who, who died also about two years ago. So John Mack is telling the both of them what he'd heard from Bud Hopkins about aliens and people getting abducted, and they were aghast. They said, this is absolutely uh, impossible and you're ruining your career if you talk about this. And Sagan, who was in many ways, you know, very uh, ahead of his time in exploring the universe and intelligent life and all that, he also thought that John had gone off the deep end and said, uh, uh, you know, don't talk about this to anybody else and, you, you know, this will ruin your career and it's obviously all kinds of crazy stuff, uh, but they couldn't talk him out of it. And um, uh, John went on to lecture to Harvard, and, uh, and that's when uh, he started getting famous. Fascinating. Can you imagine Carl Sagan telling you not to pursue it, and you're like, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so fascinating. Well, Carl Sagan gave Groff some shit, too, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he... Uh, <laughs> A lot of people. I mean, in my book, uh, uh, Lawrence Rockefeller, 
who was one of Mac's big supporters, uh, gave Mac a lot of money for his research. And Lawrence, as you probably know, was uh, very much into paranormal research uh, as well as uh, conservation, uh, two very rather different, or maybe not, maybe not so different hmm. fields of interest. But anyway, he was very uh, interested in these stories of uh, alien abduction and UFOs and did a lot of, paid for a lot of research and he uh, tried to convince Carl Sagan to keep an open mind and to entertain this, and Sagan wouldn't have it. Uh, and I tell that story in my book. So uh, it's interesting. Sagan sort of looms over the, the landscape in, in many ways, uh, both as a groundbreaking scientist, you know, who sent the uh, probes uh, through the universe with records of human experience in case uh, uh, aliens can ever access these uh, objects that we've sent out into the universe and they would know that you know there are human beings intelligences on earth so he was way ahead of his time but he he was very adamant against uh, john mack and that's the the steady mm. project right that carl sagan when he said yeah. that yeah yeah cool that's what i thought the search for extraterrestrial intelligence john mack had a good mm. line about that you know, uh, this idea is to send radio signals into the universe. It's very cheap to do that. Um, and the idea is that um, uh, any alien intelligence that would receive these radio signals would know that there's intelligent life on Earth sending it out. And um, these have been, and, and the SETI project has been going on for quite some decades. And John Mack said it was really ridiculous to think that any alien civilization would be tuning into radio waves, which is so anthropocentric. He said it's like searching the universe for a good Italian restaurant. Um, <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. That's a good quote. Uh, <laughs> interesting. That's an excellent analogy. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. And for those who aren't familiar with this project, the uh, kind of satellite, kind of, hey, we're here project. Uh, Radio Lab did a great thing on that a bunch of years ago, and it's worth checking out. It's kind of a beautiful story. Uh, interesting. Um, you know, despite me having issues with Carl Sagan, I still think he had a lot of beautiful things. Yeah, going. he did. And uh, I mean, that Cosmos series he did on television in the in the seventies, yeah. I believe, was the most watched uh, series ever on television, as far as I know. So something like that. I mean, you know, millions and millions of viewers. Yeah, I think it's like right. the most watched public broadcast thing. Right. But yeah, like crazy though. It's so popular. I'm like I first heard of SETI on the X Files, but I'm a, right. <laughs> I'm an X Files nerd. Oh, all of this is so fascinating. All these connections between just all these different fields that I find so fascinating that you wouldn't at first assume that these people knew each other or that this research intersects, and yet it does to me is just so inspiring and exciting and just really want to thank you for sharing all this, Ralph. It's so fascinating to me. Well, um, um. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, a field that I got caught up in. Um, and I, I think John Mack, uh, you know, did a great job in bringing this to public attention. He, he was a human being. He made, he made mistakes. He was flawed. He wasn't perfect, but, uh, he, he really did a lot to, uh, uh, open up the field. And I think, uh, in that sense, he's a hero. Mm. I agree. All right. <laughs> Maybe one final fun question. Cause I'm just reading Ooh. Michelle's list of questions here <laughs> um, and then we can wrap it up. And this one's a little extreme, but I'll let you kind of riff on whatever way you want to go. Do you think the government might have a program, <laughs> um, where, agents or employees might be using DMT to communicate with entities? Like they've spent money on weirder things. Yeah. But well, yeah. um, I mean, the, the government has definitely f funded some unusual research. Uh, Russell Targ's um, Palo Alto, uh, you know, think tank, uh, Sanford Research mm. Institute uh, uh, that ran all these experiments with remote viewing the CIA yeah. uh, is a perfect example. They um, uh, had people, everyone apparently has this psychic ability to some extent, but there were certain people like Ingo Swan who had it to an unusual degree, and they were able to envision things um, great distances away. So, mm -hmm. uh, and the government funded that for a long time. Then they withdrew the funding saying that, oh, it wasn't proven, but 
from what I know, um, it, was, it was quite provocative, and it did seem to bear out in, in many cases of the experiments uh, to, to really an astounding degree. So maybe the CIA just didn't like the publicity it was getting and decided not to. So, you know, that said, I think the government has funded some some strange things. They funded MK Ultra, which sounds like a mm-hmm. fantasy nightmare of giving, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, psychedelic drugs to unsuspecting people to see, you know, to test their reactions. And this um, Blanche Chavosti, who originally got John Mack interested in alien abduction through Stan Groff's, uh, uh, you know, holotropic breathing, breathing uh sessions at Esalen, she her- described herself as a victim of MK Ultra, and she said she was kidnapped and forced to ingest drugs, and, you know, there's no proof of it. Uh, the, the files were destroyed, of course, but Congress looked into MK Ultra, and it was a heinous, heinous chapter in, in American history. Uh, it's, almost, uh, it's almost too unbelievable to, to believe that the government would, would do this, and yet what sounds like a conspiracy theory actually turned out to be true. The, the government really did this, and it was horrible. And uh, it was a lot of people got away with it who designed this program, and I don't think there were any prosecutions as a result. But anyway, so you know, you say that, and then you say, well, the government would never do, you know, what you suggested, you know, like giving <laughs> DMT to people to help them, you know, communicate with aliens. I mean, who knows what kind of strange research has been funded. But I will say this, that John Mack was asked whether the government in, ever interfered with his, with, it, with his research. And if you, you know, you believe some of the conspiracy stories of men in black, you know, showing up to, you know, mm-hmm. to uh, frustrate uh, uh, different uh, scientists or so, uh, John Mack said, and I believe him because he, he, he didn't lie, really, he would have no reason to, he said the government never bothered him. Uh, they never sent anybody to confront him. He never, you know, was warned off his research. He never got the sense that they were monitoring him or surveilling him. So um, I find that interesting. And and I was never interfered with in my research, you know, with, with for the New York Times on UFOs. So, mm. you know, some of these stories tend to have a life of their own and people spread conspiracy stories. But all I can tell you is that in my case, uh, no, they're no government interference, and as far as John Max said, no, no government interference. Mm. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Uh, <laughs> worth noting, this is an excellent episode to come out with this on my side. My um, grandfather was stationed at Roswell during the incident mm. as an Air Force captain and kept the secrets. <laughs> Took him to his grave. Really? <gasps> he insisted they weren't very impressive, <sighs> but... That might have just been the company Does line, right? Well, that's the problem, you know, with Roswell now. It is so overlaid with myth and and stories yeah. that it's almost impossible to get at the truth now. I mean, there have been so many books written about it and, you know, alien bodies recovered and this and that. It's just almost an impossible task to excavate uh, these stories to get at the truth because if, if it had been done right the first time, uh, we probably would have a shot at some, you know, at a fresh look at what, what happened. But it's now uh, so uh, encrusted in myth and, and uh, fantasy stories. And, uh, and Roswell's, you know, parlayed this into a big tourist uh, mm. business. So they don't want to let <laughs> yeah. it go, you know. So it's, it's just impossible. It's, it's sad because it's one of the things that we'll probably never get to the bottom of now because there's been so much interference with that story. Right. I think where I landed was that it was leveraged heavily as kind of like a psychological operation to mess with the Russians and everybody well, else. Well, that's what they said, and, you know, weather balloon and uh, there was a surveillance balloon. Uh, but um, right. uh, interviews with me, I have in my book a story of a, a couple who um, uh, the, it was reported in the paper the next day who actually observed uh, a UFO uh, right, right before the crash, apparently. Uh, they didn't tell anybody about it until the word came out that something had crashed. But um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, it, it's amazing when you dig into it. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the things I have in my book, is Ken Arnold, you know, the first one to observe UFOs, mm. supposedly 1947, his famous report about UFOs over Mount Rainier, uh, which sort of ushered in the mm. UFO era. Well, uh, 
there were other, there were, as I say in my book there, I think there were 20 other reports that day of uh, UFO wow. sightings. So people who said that Ken Arnold was hallucinating or whatever, uh, well, there were many other reports <laughs> that same day backing up what he saw. So uh, it's amazing when you dig into the history, what you find. Mm. Yeah, it's endlessly fascinating. I spent years and years digging in at the same time as I was doing the psychedelic research and both were just endlessly fascinating. Mm. <laughs> Psychedelics seemed a little bit more realistically to stay involved with for a long time. So. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> they stay, stayed on this side. Anyway, Ralph, thank you very much for this. I, I know we're kind of um, going on a bit over an hour now, but this has been super interesting and can't wait to finish your book. Michelle keeps talking very highly of it, so I'm very excited. Great. And, you know, just from the first chapter, I was blown away. Like, you're a wonderful writer. Well, thank you. Thank I'm you. just like having a smile on my face the whole time I'm reading. Good. Well, spread the word. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we will. Is there anything you'd, you'd like to leave our, our listeners with or uh, websites or anything like that? Uh, no, I mean, the book is available uh, through, you know, all the booksellers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, there's a bit of delay now with Amazon. I think they sold out the stock they had, but they're getting more in. Uh, independent bookstores have it. It's on a Kindle. So if you really want to read it right away, you can get it instantaneously on Kindle. So uh, there will be an audio book. I've gotten some queries on that for people who like to listen to books. I think uh, uh, my publisher, University of New Mexico Press, High Road Books, has just uh, made a deal with an audio book uh, producer. So um, so that should be out. So um, yeah, there are many ways to get it, and uh, it's a pleasure talking to you guys. And uh, I, you know, very well informed, and it's an interesting aspect of of John Mack's uh, uh, research, his interest in, in psychedelic drugs, and, uh, you know, definitely part of his uh, his persona. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing so much with us. It's been so fascinating. I'm going to be have like a, what's the expression, a skip in my step today. Uh, this was really oh. fun for me, so thank you. <laughs> well, and that's thank you great. for your work. I really, really recommend The Believer to everyone out there. It was a great read. I really enjoyed it. I think you all will too. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I'd love to see the link when you uh, put it up. For sure. And there you have it, Ralph Blumenthal. I hope you all enjoyed that one. This is a really interesting topic. Uh, in fact, I think as I record this or in the next day or two, Michelle will be running a uh, really cool panel with uh, some people about psychedelics and aliens, Andrew Gallimore, David Luke, and others, I believe. So really, really cool topic. Glad Michelle's uh, digging in on that one a little more. Yeah. What is this idea of multiple realities? What are these things actually? <laughs> is there a way to pin down what they are actually? Are they nuts and bolts? Are they something different? Did they physically fly all that way? Who knows? Um, I don't think we have a clear enough story yet. And the data is pretty spotty, unfortunately. But people need to keep digging in. And hopefully we'll find a winner and uh, a really clear story in the future. Yeah. So I think that's it about this part. Again, um, thanks everybody for listening. If you want to help us out, just tell a friend about the show. Uh, if you want to get educated on psychedelics and get ready for all these clients that are going to be coming to you to talk about their psychedelic experiences or needing help prepping for their psychedelic experiences, come take our class, Navigating Psychedelics for Clinicians and Therapists. Amazing eight-week program. You can learn more at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And I uh, hope you like it. Oh, and it's 420. So happy 420. Um, we've got some really interesting uh, Instagrams coming out today and uh, the day uh, before uh, 419, Bicycle Day, uh, we should have done some live streams. So yeah, it's interesting thinking about the future and talking about it as if it's the past, but I guess that's uh, the job of a podcaster. Uh, anyway, yeah, really cool weekend coming up. Stay tuned to social and a lot of really fun events and we probably even emailed you some stuff about events too. So check your email. If, you, if you're if you on our list, you should have got some good stuff. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is Joe Moore signing off for Psychedelics Today from Breckenridge, Colorado. We'll see you next time. 